Welcome back, fourth graders, to our last chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerers of Stone. Um, last time on our reading for chapter 16, um, we learned uh, that Harry, Ron, and Hermione uh, got through the trap doors, the trap door that Fluffy was guarding. Um, we go through about a few different uh, chambers, and they have to uh, figure out how to get past the different charms and bewitchings and the different spells on them. So we ended the chapter with Harry going into the last chamber and um, he said there was someone already there but it wasn't Snape and it wasn't Voldemort. So that is what we ended on. So we will be reading chapter 17 called The Man with Two Faces. It was Quirrell. You, gasped Harry. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But I thought, Snape, Severus, Quirrell laughed. It wasn't, it, and it wasn't his usual quivering tremble either, but a cold and sharp, yes, Severus, doesn't seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like you, like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would you suspect, poor stuttering P -P Professor Quirrell? Harry couldn't take it all in. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But Snape tried to kill me. No, no, no. I tried to kill you. Your friend Miss Granger accidentally knocked me over as she rushed to set a fire to Snape at the Quidditch match. She broke my eye contact with you. Another few seconds and you'd have gotten off that broom. I'd managed it before. Then, if Snape hadn't been muttering a counter curse trying to save you. Snape was trying to save me? Of course, said Quirrell coolly. Why do you think he wanted to referee the next, your next match? He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really. He didn't he needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor from winning. He did make himself unpopular. And what a waste of time, when, after all that, I'm just going to kill you tonight. Quirrell snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of the thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. You're too nosy to live, Potter. Scurrying around the school on Halloween like that, for all I knew, you had seen me coming to look at what I was guarding, the stone. You let in the troll? Certainly, I have special gift with trolls. You must have seen what I did to the one in the chamber back there. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who had already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to heed me off. And not only did my troll fail to beat you to death, that three-headed dog didn't even manage to bite Snape's leg off properly. Now, wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. It was only then that Harry realized that was standing behind Quirrell. It was the mirror of air said. This mirror is the key to finding the stone, Quirrell muttered tapping his way around the frame. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this. But he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he gets back. All Harry could do was keep Quirrell talking and stop him from concentrating on the mirror. I saw you and Snape in the forest, he blurted out. Yes, said Quirrell idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was, the, he was on to me by that time, trying to find out how far I'd got. He suspected me all along, tried to frighten me as though he could when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Quirrell came back out behind the mirror and stared hungrily into it. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master. But where is it? Harry struggled against the ropes, binding him, but they didn't give. He had to keep Quirrell from giving his whole attention to the mirror. But Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Quirrell casually. Heavens, yes, he was at Hogwarts with your father, didn't you know? 
They loathed each other. He never wanted you dead, though. But I heard you a few days ago sobbing. I thought Snape was threatening you. For the first time, a spasm of fear flitted across Quirrell's face. Sometimes, he said, I find it hard to follow my master's instructions. He is a great wizard, and I am weak. You mean he was there in the room with you? Harry gasped. He is with me wherever I go, said Quirrell quietly. I met him when I traveled around the world, a foolish young man I was then, rid full, of rid uh, rid oh, goodness. full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. There is no good in evil. There is only power, and those too weak to seek it. Since then, I served him faithfully, although I have let him down many times. He has had to be very hard on me. Quirrell shivered, sudden, Quirrell shivered suddenly. He does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was almost he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. Quirrell's voice trailed away. Harry was remembering his trip to Diagon Alley. How could he have been so stupid? He had seen Quirrell that very day, shaken hands with him in the leaky cauldron. Quirrell crushed under his breath, cursed under his breath. I don't understand. Is the stone inside the mirror? Should I break it? Harry's mind was racing. What I want more than anything else in the world at this moment, he thought, is to find the stone before Quirrell does. So if I look in the mirror, I should see myself finding it, which means I'll see where it's hidden. But how can I look without Quirrell realizing what I'm up to? He tried to edge to the left to get in front of the glass without Quirrell noticing, but the ropes around his ankles were too tight. He tripped and fell over. Quirrell ignored him. He was still talking to himself. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master. And to Harry's horror, a voice answered. And the voice seemed to come from, in, from Quirrell himself. Use the boy. Use the boy. Quirrell rounded on Harry. Yes, Potter, come here. He clasped his hands once, and the ropes binding Harry fell off. Harry got slowly to his feet. Come here, Quirrell repeated. Look in the mirror. Tell me what you see. Harry walked towards him. I must lie, he thought desperately. I must look and lie about what I see. That's all. Quirrell moved behind him. Uh, Harry breathed in a funny smell that seemed to come from Quirrell's turban. He closed his eyes, stepped in front of the mirror, and opened them again. He saw his reflection, pale and scared looking at first, but a moment later his reflection smiled at him. It put its hand into its pocket and pulled out a blood-red stone. It winked and put the stone back in its pocket. And as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his real pocket. Somehow, incredibly, he had gotten the stone. Well, said Quirrell impatiently, what do you see? Harry screwed up his courage. I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore. He invented, I, I won the house cup for Gryffindor. Quirrell cursed again. Get out of the way, he said, as Harry moved aside. He felt the sorcerer's stone against his leg. Dare he make a break for it? But he hadn't walked five paces before a high voice, voice spoke, though Quirrell's lips weren't moving. He lies. He lies. Potter, come back here, Quirrell shouted. Tell me the truth. What did you just see? The high voice spoke again. Let me speak to him face to face. Master, you are not strong enough. I have strength for this. Harry felt as if Devil's Snare was rooting him to the spot. He couldn't move a muscle. Petrified, he watched as Quirrell reached up. It began to unwrap his turban. What's going on? The turban fell away. Quirrell's head looked strangely small without it. Then 
he turned slowly on the spot. Harry would have screamed, but he couldn't make a sound. Where there should have been a back to Quirrell's head, there was a face. The most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. Harry tried to take a step backwards, but his legs wouldn't move. See what I've become, the face said. Mere shadows and vapor. I have form only when I can share another body, but there has there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Uni unicorn blood has strengthened me. These past weeks, you saw Faithful Quarrel drinking it for me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to create a body of my own. Now, why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So he knew. The feeling suddenly surged back into Harry's legs, and he stumbled backwards. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar, Harry shouted suddenly. Quirrell was walking backwards at him so that Voldemort could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. How touching, it hissed. I always value ba bravery. Yes, boy, your parents were brave. I killed your father first, and he put up a courageous fight. But your mother needn't have died. She was protecting you. Now give me the stone, unless you want her to have died in vain. Never! Harry sp sprang towards the fl flame door, but Voldemort screamed, Seize him! The next second, Harry felt Quirrell's hand close around his wrist. At once, a needle-sharp pain seared across Harry's scar. His head felt as though it was about to split into two. He yelled, struggling with all his might, and to his surprise, Quirrell let go of him. The pain in his head lessened. He looked around wildly to see where Quirrell had gone, and saw him hunched in pain. Looking at his fingers, they were blistering before his eyes. Seize him! Seize him! shrieked Voldemort again, and Quirrell lunged, knocking Harry clean off his feet, landing on top of him, both hands around Harry's neck. Harry's scar was almost blinding him with pain, yet he could see Quirrell howling in agony. Master, I cannot hold him. My hands! My hands! And Quirrell, though pinning Harry to the ground with his knees, let go of his neck and stared bewildered at his own palms. Harry could see they looked burned, raw, red, and shiny. Then kill him, fool, and be done, screeched Voldemort. Quirrell raised his hands to form a deadly curse, but Harry, by instinct, reached up and grabbed Quirrell's face. Ah! Quirrell rolled off his, him, his face blistering, too, and then Harry knew. Quirrell couldn't touch his bare skin, not without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep hold of Quirrell, keep him in enough pain to stop him from doing a curse. Harry jumped to his feet, caught Quirrell by the arm, and hung on to him as tight as he could. Quirrell screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building. He couldn't see. He could only hear Quirrell's terrible shrieks in Voldemort yelled of him. Kill him! Kill him! and other voices, maybe in Harry's own head, crying, Harry! Harry! He felt Quirrell's arm and arm wrenched from his grasp, knew all was lost, and fell back into blackness, fell into blackness, down, down, down. Something gold was glinting just above him, the snitch. He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't the snitch at all. It was a pair of glasses, how strange. He blinked again. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore swam into view above him. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at him and then remembered, Sir, the stone! It was Quirrell! He's got the stone, sir, quick! Calm yourself, dear boy. You are a little behind the times, he said, Dumbledore. Said Dumbledore. Quirrell does not have the stone. Then who does, sir? I... Relax, please, Harry. 
or Madame Pomfrey will have thrown you out. Harry swallowed and looked around him and realized he must have been in the hospital wing. He was lying in a bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore, gleaming. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret, so naturally the whole school knows. I believe your friends, Mr. Fred and George Weasley, were responsible for trying to send you a toilet seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, felt it might not be hygienic and confiscated it. How long have I been in here? Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come around. They have been extremely worried. But, sir, the stone. I see you're not to be distracted. Very well. The stone? Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from me. I arrived in time to prevent that. Although you were doing very well on your own, I must say. You got there? You got Hermione's owl? We must have crossed in mid-air. No sooner I'd reached London than it became clear to me that the place I should be was the one I had just left. I arrived just in time to put a quarrel off of you. It was you. I feared I might be too late. You nearly were. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone, boy. You. The effort involved nearly killed you. For one terrible moment there, I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. Destroyed? Harry said blankly. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, you know about Nicholas? said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. But that means he and his, life, his wife will die, won't they? They have enough elixir store to set their affairs in order, and then, yes, they will die. Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. To one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas in Purnell, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. As much money and life as you could want, the two things most human beings would choose well above. The trouble is, humans do not have a knack for choosing precisely those things are the worst for them. Harry lay there, lost for words. Dumbledore hummed a little and smiled at the ceiling. Sir, Harry said, I've been thinking, sir, even if the stone's gone, Vald I mean, you know who, call him Voldemort. Harry, always use the proper name for things. Fear of names increases fear of the thing itself. Yes, sir. Well, Voldemort's going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? No, Harry, he has not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you may have only delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. If he is delayed again and again, why, he may never return to power. Harry nodded, but stopped quickly because it became because it made his head hurt. Then he said, Sir, there are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me. Things I want to know the truth about. The truth, Dumbledore sighed. It is a beautiful and terrible thing, and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions, unless I have a very good reason not to do. In which case, I will beg your forgiveness. I shall not, of course, lie. Well, Voldemort said that he only killed my mother because she tried to stop him from killing me. But why would he want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore sighed very deeply this time. <sighs> Alas, the first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Not today. Not now. You will know one day. 
Put it from your mind for now, Harry. When you are older, I know you hate to hear this. When you are ready, you will know. And Harry knew it would be would be no good to argue. But why couldn't Quirrell touch me? Your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love, as powerful as your mother's for you, leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign to have been loved so deeply, even though the peer person who... I am so sorry. Even though... Um, not a scar, nor a visible sign, to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for his reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. Dumbledore now became very interested in a bird out on the windowsill which gave Harry time to dry his eyes on the sheets. When he had found his voice again, Harry said, And the invisibility cloak? Do you know who sent it to me? Ah, your father happened to leave it in my possession, and I thought you might like it. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Useful things. Your father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchen to steal food when, there, when he was here. And there is something else. Fire away. Quirrell said Snape. Professor Snape, Harry. Yes, him. Quirrell said he hates me because he hated my father. Is that true? Well, they did not. They did rather detest each other. Not unlike yourself and Ma Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could never forgive. What? He saved his life. What? Yes, said Dumbledore dreamily. Funny the way people's minds work, isn't it? Professor Snape couldn't bear being in your father's debt. I do believe he worked so hard to protect you this year because he felt that it would make him and your father even. Then he could go back into hating your father's memory in peace. Harry tried to understand this, but it made his head pound, so he stopped. And sir, there's one more thing. Just the one. How did I get the snow stone out of the mirror? Ah, now I'm glad you asked that of me. It was one of my more brilliant ideas. And between you and me, that's saying something. You see, only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they'd just see themselves making gold and drinking the elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Now, enough questions. I suggest you start. You make a start on these sweets. Ah, birdie, bo birdie bots, every flavored beans. I was fortunate enough in my youth to come across a vomit flavored one. And since then, I'm afraid I've rather lost the liking for them. But I think I'll be safe with a nice toffee, don't you? He smiled and popped the golden brown bead into his mouth. Then he choked and said, Ah, oh, alas, earwax. Madame Pomfrey, the nurse, was a nice woman, but very strict. Just five minutes, Harry pleaded. Absolutely not. You let Professor Dumbledore in. Well, of course, that was the headmaster. Quite different. You need rest. I'm resting. Look, lying down and everything. Oh, go on, Madame Pomfrey. Oh, very well, she said. But five minutes only. And she let Ron and Hermione in. Harry! Hermione looked ready to fling her arms around him again, but Harry was glad she held herself in, as his head was still very sore. Oh, Harry, we were sure you were going to. Dumbledore was so worried. The whole school's talking about it, said Ron. What really happened? It was one of those rare occasions when the true story is even more strange than the exciting than more strange and exciting than the wild rumors. Harry told them everything. Quirrell, the mirror, the stone, and Voldemort. Ron and Hermione were very good a were very good audience. They gasped in all the right places, and when Harry told them what was under Quirrell's turban, Hermione screamed out loud. So the stone's gone? And Ron fin said Ron finally, Flamel's just going to die? 
that's what I said. That's what I said. But Dumbledore thinks that what was, what was it? To the well-organized mind, death is but not the next great adventure. I always said he was off his rockers, said Ron, looking quite impressed at how crazy his hero was. So what happens to you two, said Harry. Well, I got back all right, said Hermione. I brought Ron, I brought Ron round. That took a while. And we were dashing up to the Owlry to contact Dumbledore when we met him in the entrance hall. He already knew. He just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? And hurtled off to the third floor. Do you think he meant you to do it? said Ron, sending your father's cloak and everything. Well, Hermione exploded. If he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, said Harry thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know? I reckon he had a pretty good idea of what we were trying to, going to try, and instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It almost was like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. Yeah. Dumbledore's off his rockers, all right, said Ron proudly. Listen, you've got to be up for the end of the year feast tomorrow. The points are all in, and Slytherin's won, of course. You missed the last Quidditch match. We were steamrolled by Ravenclaw without you, but the food will be good. At that moment, moment Madame Pomfrey bust, busted over. You've had nearly 15 minutes. Now out, she said firmly. After a good night's sleep, Harry felt nearly back to normal. I want to go to the feast, he told Madame Pomfrey as she straightened his many candy boxes. Can I? Can't I? Professor Dumbledore says you are allowed to go, she said stiffly, as though in her opinion Dumbledore didn't realize how risky feasts could be. And you have another visitor. Oh, good, said Harry. Who is it? Hagrid slid through the door as he spoke. As usual, when he was indoors, Hagrid looked too big to be allowed. He sat down next to Harry, took one look at him, and bust into tears. It's all my ruddy fault, he sobbed, his face in his hands. I told the evil git how to get past Fluffy. I told him it was the only thing he didn't know, and I told him. You could have died. All for a dragon egg. I'll never drink again. I should be chucked out and made to live as a muggle. Hagrid, said Harry, shocked to see Hagrid shaking with grief and remorse, great tears leaking down his into his beard. Hagrid, he'd found out somehow. Found out somehow. This is Voldemort we're talking about. He'd have found out even if you hadn't told him. You could have died, sobbed Hagrid. And, and don't say the name Voldemort, Harry bellowed. And Hagrid was so shocked, he stopped crying. I've met him, and I'm calling him by his name. Please, cheer up, Hagrid. We've saved the stone. It's gone. He can't use it. Have a chocolate frog. I've got loads. Hagrid wiped his nose on the back of his hand and said, That reminds me, I've got a present for you. It's not a stoat sandwich, is it? Harry said anxiously, and at last Harry gave Hagrid gave a weak chuckle. Nah, Dumbledore gave me the day off yesterday to fix it. Of course, he should have sacked me instead. Anyways, gotcha this. It seemed to be a handsome, leather-covered book. Harry opened it curiously. It was full of wizard photographs, smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. Sent owls off to your parents' old school friends, asking for photos. Knew you didn't have any. You'd like it? Harry couldn't speak, but Hagrid understood. Harry made his way down to the end of the year feast alone that night. He had held, he had been held up by Madame Pomfrey, fussing about insisting on giving him one last checkup. So the great hall was already full. It was decked out in Slytherin colors of green and silver to celebrate Slytherins winning the House Cup for the seventh year in a row. A huge banner showing the Slytherin serpent covered in the walls behind the high table. When Harry walked in, there was a sudden hush, and then everybody stared 
started talking loudly at once. He slipped into the seat between Ron and Hermione at the Gryffindor table and tried to ignore the fact that people were standing up to look at him. Fortunately, Dumbledore arrived moments later. The babbles died away. Another year gone, Dumbledore said cheerfully, and I must trouble you with an old man's wheezing waffle before we sink our teeth into a delicious feast. What a year it's been. Hopefully your heads are all a little fuller than they were. You have the whole summer ahead to get them nice and empty before next year starts. Now, as I understand it, the house cup here needs a warding. The points, the points stand thus. In fourth place, Gryffindor, with 312 points. In third, Hufflepuff, with 352. Ravenclaw has 426 in Slytherin, 472. A storm of cheering and stamping broke out from the Slytherin's table. Harry could see Draco Malfoy banging his goblet on the table. It was a sickening sight. Yes, yes, well done, Slytherin, said Dumbledore. However, recent events must be taken into account. The room went very still. The Slytherin's smiles faded a little. Ahem. <clears throat> said Dumbledore. I have a few last minute points to dish out. Let me see. Yes, first, to Mr. Wa Ronald Weasley. Ron went purple in the face. He looked a little reddish radish with the bad sun sunburn. For the best played game of chess Hogwarts has seen many years, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Gryffindor's cheers nearly raised the bewitched ceilings, and the stars overhead seemed to quiver. Percy could be he heard telling the other prefects, That's my brother, you know. My youngest brother got past McGonagall's giant chess set. At last there was silence. Second, to Miss Granger, for the use of cool logic in the face of fire, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Hermione buried her face in her arms. Harry strongly suspected she had burst into tears. Gryffindor up and down the table Gryffindors up and down the table were beside themselves. They were a hundred points up. Third to Mr. Harry Potter, said Dumbledore. The room went deadly quiet. For the pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor House. 60 points. The din was def deafening. Those who could add up while yelling themselves hoarse knew that Gryffindor now had 472 points, exactly the same as Slytherin. They had tied for the house cup if only Dumbledore had given Harry just one more point. Dumbledore raised his hand. The room, great, uh, the room fell silent. There are all kinds of courage, said Dumbledore, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award ten points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Someone standing outside the Great Hall might as well have thought some sort of explosion had taken place. So loud was the noise that erupted from the Gryffindor table Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood up to yell and cheer as Neville, white with shock, disappeared under a pile of people hugging him. He had never won so much as a point for Gryffindor before. Harry, still cheering, nudged Ron in the ribs and pointed at Malfoy, who couldn't have looked more stunned and horrified if he had just had the body-bind curse on him. Which means, Dumbledore called over the storm of applause, even, er, for even Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were celebrating the downfall of Slytherin. We need a little change of decoration. He clapped his hands, and in an instant, the green hangings became scarlet, and the silver became gold. The huge Slytherin serpent vanished, and a towering Gryffindor lion took its place. Snape was shaking Professor McGonagall's hand with a horrible, forced smile. He caught Harry's eye, and Harry knew at once that Snape, Snape's feeling towards him hadn't changed one jot. 
This didn't worry Harry. It seemed as though life would be back to normal next year, or as normal it had ever been at Hogwarts. It was the best evening of Harry's life, better than winning at Quidditch, or Christmas, or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. Harry had almost forgotten that the exam results were still to come, but come they did. To their great surprise, both he and Ron passed with good marks. Hermione, of course, had the best grades of uh, the first years. Even Neville scraped through, his good herbology marks making up for his potion ones. They had hoped that Goyle, who was almost as stupid as he was mean, might be thrown out, but he passed too. It was a shame, but as Ron said, you couldn't have everything in life. And suddenly, their wardrobes were empty, their trunks were packed, Neville's toad was found lurking in the corner of the toilets, notes were all handed out to the students, warning them not to use magic over the holidays. I always hope they'll forgive, uh, forget to give us these, said Fred Weasley sadly. Hagrid was there to take them down the, the fleet of boats that sailed across the lake. They were boarding the Hogwarts Express talking and laughing as the countryside became greener and tidier, eating birdie bots every flavored beans as they sped past the muggle towns, pulling off their wizard robes and putting on jackets and coats, pulling into platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross Station. It took quite a while for them all to get off the platform. A wizard old guard, um, guard was up by the ticket barrier letting them go through the gate in twos and threes so they didn't attract attention by all bursting out of a solid wall at once in an alarming mug alarming the muggles you must come and stay this summer said ron both of you i'll send you an owl thanks said harry i'll need something to look forward to people jostled them as they moved forward towards the gateway back to the muggle world some of them called Bye, Harry. See you, Potter. Still famous, said Ron, grinning at him. Not where I'm going, I promise you, said Harry. He, Ron, and Hermione passed through the gateway together. There he was. Mom, there he is. Look. It was Ginny Weas Weasley, Ron's younger sister, but she wasn't pointing at Ron. Harry Potter, she squealed. Look, Mom, I can see. Be quiet, Ginny. It's rude to point. Mrs. Weasley smiled down at them. Busy year, she said. Very, said Harry. Thanks for the fudge and the sweater, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, it was nothing, dear. Are you ready? It was Uncle Vernon, still purple-faced, still mustached, still looking furious at the nerve of Harry, carrying an owl cage, carrying an owl in a cage, in a station full of ordinary people. Behind him stood Aunt Petunia and Dudley, looking terrified at the very sight of Harry. You must be Harry's family, said Mrs. Weasley, in a man manner of speaking, said Uncle Vernon. Hurry up, boy, we haven't got all day. He walked away. Harry hung back for a last word with Ron and Hermione. See you over the summer, then? Hope you have a, a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry and they were surprised at the grin that was spreading over his face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer. And that is the end. And so, the next book is The Chamber of Secrets, and on our Canvas page, you actually can start clicking on the links. Uh, Miss Day is reading uh, the second book. She has a few chapters out right now. I think she's gone up to chapter 10. So if you want to read the second book, Miss Day's YouTube has all of, or has most of the second um, chapter, or second book's chapters up. So thank you for uh, the ones who have been listening in to our Harry Potter read aloud. I had so much fun reading this book with you guys. So with that, Goodbye, everyone.